It's Wednesday. You know what that means. Time for the Southern California Writers Association Hump Day Book Tour. I'm your host, Maddie Margarita, here with Diana Pardee on tech. Every uh, Wednesday morning, the Southern California Writers Association turns our Facebook page over to a new writer to introduce their books and their work. Uh, and I'm excited to welcome Pamela Fagan Hutchins this morning. Welcome, Pamela. Thanks for having me. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we started about your weather up there in lovely Wyoming. Uh, <laughs> and you said it's warmer today, right? It is. It's normal. It's 20 degrees. Last week it was minus 25. So we've had quite the swing. Um, feeling sorry for my friends in Texas and other states right now that are going through the extreme temps. Yeah. So is this writing weather for you or? You know, it's great writing weather, but even more for me, I record audiobooks as well, and it's great recording weather. It's a dampening, soft snowfall, and we live in this lodge on the face, the eastern face of the Bighorn Mountains in northern Wyoming, that in the summer we run as a lodge, and so in the summer it's pandemonium. So the winter is when I get all my quiet stuff done. So you must... I know you said you do a lot of recording, but you do a lot of writing. Do you want to talk a little bit about your series? You have multiple series, multiple yeah. books. Um, how do you manage all that? A little bit of um, multiple personality disorder helps, but it's it's just kind of one of those sad afflictions that I have, which is I just can't ever quite stop working. But I do have multiple series. Um, I started out writing series that I think I would classify as women's fiction mysteries. They're straight up mysteries, female protagonists with a really strong character driven element. And I did those for about 15 books. And then I accidentally started writing a series with a male lead featuring all of the members in a family that were mysteries set in the 1970s in Wyoming that are reflective of my childhood. And so that's the series that I'm working on now, Patrick Flint series and the new one, Snaggletooth, which is coming out next month. So those are set, um, well, let's talk about settings. You have interesting, you've chosen interesting settings for your series. Uh, how, how do you decide um, where you're going to set them and does it impact the story that you choose to set there? My gosh, you ask good questions. Okay, for, so st for starters, to me, the setting has to be important, has to mean something because it rises to the level of a character for me. The setting is going to be so important to not only the characters, their culture, their history, their religion, their relationship with nature, you know, et cetera, but also whatever mystery there is. I try to choose something that's really reflective of that area and couldn't happen anywhere else. So it's all for me really intimate and intertwined. Um, and they always are settings that I can get my heart into. So, you know, I started writing books in the Caribbean, set in a house that I owned there. Um, then I, I uh, branched out to Texas where I grew up. And here we are in Wyoming where I spent my early childhood. And, and that's really been what's driven me on settings. So when, when people imagine uh, living in a lodge in Wyoming, they imagine a certain lifestyle and a certain amount of um, self um, uh, determination and self-reliance. Um, does that, does that carry through your um, characters or? I think it does. Um, I, I love to do the fish out of water thing, you know, where I take someone that's not used to that lifestyle and throw them into it and watch how they handle it and, and all the differences from what most of us currently live. I mean, the bulk of the population lives in city centers and not on a lot in a lodge on the face of the Bighorn Mountains that's off the grid. You know, we were talking before we went on air that our house runs on solar panel, and, excuse me, solar power. And with this polar vortex, our solar panels are covered with snow. They, the snow's frozen on there. The panels won't um, generate electricity. And we're out there chipping off snow and brushing off snow in snowshoes to get down there to the panels. And I think, you know, most people don't live like this anymore, um, but we love it. And so for my characters, I try to give them growth that is reflective of that, even if they don't start out really embracing it. So I, I you know, I, I have um, an impression that, that it, your stories are, are very strongly character driven. 
but so do you do you come up with the stories beforehand and then um, come up with the characters that fit into those stories or do you come up with the characters and then they do what they will the characters do what they will and they are as you said they're super character driven um, so character driven that when I originally was writing them, I didn't even think of them as mysteries. And, you know, when other people would read them and it tried to explain what I was doing to me, they were like, no, you kill people in the first chapter. That's a mystery. <laughs> but they are super character driven. And, um, and I will live with the characters in my head sometimes for months and talk with my husband, who's my story partner talk with the characters in my head until the story begins to suggest itself and reveal itself and in, including whatever the underlying mystery will be. Have you always been a writer? In my heart, <laughs> in my closet. Um, <laughs> I started seriously writing in my forties. Um, I'd always been secretly doing it. My third grade teacher here in Wyoming told my parents I'd be a novelist. and I told them she was crazy, but it turns out she was right. And, and um, when did you, do, are, are you writing full time? When did you start to write full time? Yeah, I'm writing full time. And I started that in 2014. Really, Maddie, it's funny because this was before the advent of Kindle Unlimited. And as an independent writer, I I'm, guess I'm hybrid, um, but independent writer, I, um, I was very loath to go full time, but I also was experiencing some early success for me, that financial success. And I thought, wow, this is great. And then Kindle came, Kindle Unlimited came in and crashed the ship and I had to relearn how to do everything. But um, my husband just retired, um, semi-retired. He still got one little teeny toe in work. Um, but all that is thanks to the books and um, and they're doing well enough that, that we can live a lifestyle where I write, I record the audiobooks, we run the lodge and, and things are sweet. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that because not, not every writer that I talk to has that same story. But <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the audiobook part of this because um, I, I heard a, a professional audiobook narrator read a story yeah, it was a story that I would never have read um, because reading it myself and hearing it in my, my head was not as interesting as hearing the way that he read it. And when he read it, I was like, I could read that book. And then I started reading it myself. And I was like, this is a totally different experience. <laughs> it lacks seeing the story through somebody else's filter. Um, but now are you, you're recording your own books, right? I am, and I've started doing other people's as well. Before I was a writer, I also was a performer, um, and, and not a professional performer, but a, a relentless performer, you know? <laughs> um, so it was kind of a natural transition for me. I was a little worried about it because now you take that layer of insecurity about your own books and your own words on a page, and you add that layer of insecurity about your performance, and it's just a whole mess of <laughs> feeling exposed. But I ended up loving it. And I also, I hadn't been always happy with the narrators for my books. Um, some of them are extremely talented, but yet it's not the way you envisioned it, right? It's just uh -huh. not the story you thought you were telling. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing it myself. It's been a hoot. I love doing it. The hard part for me was sound. Sound is a dirty, awful beast and a bad sound and dirty sound just leaks in no matter what. Today, when I was recording, our blankety blank cats were having fights and playing tag upstairs and I'm screaming expletives at them and cats don't listen to anything, you know? And then we've got my husband who decides to go plow and you can hear the snow plow outside. And you know, it's just everything, little bitty sounds. And that's what I didn't expect. I'd never had to, I had to work on sound. So it's been fun. So life, life intrudes. But so as, as you're doing this, as you're recording, and um, going through your books and other people's books, how has that impacted your writing or has it when you? It, first of all, it's introduced for my own books, this last proofread that is humiliating, humbling, you know, where you think everything's great. You've had the best proofreaders, the best copy editors, you've given it your best effort and then you read it out loud and you're like, how could I suck so bad? <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
<laughs> and you're making all those last minute changes. So now it's like, I feel like it'd be going naked to publish a book that I hadn't read aloud slowly for recording right. myself. So that has changed. Um, and, and I really, especially going back to older books, I'm now going back and re-recording some of my, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old books. Um, I see how much my writing has changed in some ways better, in some ways, things that I've given up that I like, and it makes you so deliberate because you're experiencing it as a listener by reading it. You, you both read it, you have to read it, but then you have to listen to it multiple times till you want to shoot yourself and as you're editing and mastering and stuff. So you get so many different lenses to look at it through and it's really helped. It, it sounds excruciating. Um, it's but it's, so when, when people buy one of your books, what can they expect? They the, can, ex, yeah, they can expect that it's going to be a character and setting driven mystery that if for the Patrick Flint series is going to border on thriller, um, high adventure level, really fast paced with the caveat being. I like a slow burn start. I am not going to dismember a body on the first page. I am going to introduce you to the settings and the characters. And by the first, end of the first or second chapter, you'll have your nice bloody, you know, murder. But um, I do, I do indulge in a little character and setting. Uh, well, but, and about your characters, uh, we, we touched on them before. Uh, how is writing um, your male protagonist in is what is your latest book? It's um, Snaggletooth, right? Snaggletooth's coming out March 17th and Scapegoat was uh, last September. Um, male protagonist, I was, I was nervous. Um, you know, I have been snottily sometimes a little bit um, looking down my nose over the years at some men's attempts to write women. And so here I was going out and gonna write multiple male points of view as as lead and sub lead characters because there's an adult male and then there is a young boy that are both um, points of view in the books um, but I had an ace in the hole or two really one is, is that these books were driven by wanting to make my father the protagonist of the books he'd gotten a horrible cancer diagnosis three months to live he's fine now it's been a couple of years he's licked it but in the beginning my only response to that, my coping mechanism was, well, I've got to start writing about him and I've got to allegorically write the ending that I want, which is trials and tribulations we all pull together and he pulls through. And literally the first book in this series wasn't meant for publication. It was meant as a gift to my dad to write it true um, symbolically. Mm. Ah, just hit my elbow. And so I was writing a man I knew very, very well. Um, you know, and in fact was bringing up his weaknesses and flaws in ways that sometimes really irritate my readers, you know, oh, could you just make him stop doing that? And I said, I can't, that's how he really is. <laughs> um, and so I had him them reading it and helping me. And then I had my husband who would take my 12 year old boy and cracks me up. He'd say, Pamela, you have him thinking here. 12 year old boys don't think. <laughs> their brains are basically, they're just basically empty. They're just doing life. And I'm like, okay, well, great. So my husband's also will come in and say, make him tougher, Pamela, you know, make him want to punch somebody better yet, make him punch somebody. No men are that sensitive. You just want him to be. So I've got my husband relentlessly, um, my story partner husband telling me to make my men burly and tough. And I've got my dad saying, Patrick really is a hero. Wow. What a great guy. Um, and it's been fun, but I'm constantly mindful of that little voice in my head saying, you're not a man. Be very careful here because you need to be respectful for, of a man's differences from you, just as I would if it were any character in my books, it's just amplified by it being lead. You know, we all have to write a world that includes people that are not exactly like us not just like our experiences, our gender, our religion, our race, our culture. And it's just amped up by the lead <laughs> element. So, so you are a prolific writer um, and you have a book coming out in March, as you said, Snaggletooth. Do you have it? Do you have it nearby? I should have asked you. No? Uh, do I have one? Do you have a, uh, a cover of it? I, should... I don't. I don't. Um, I should have we'll printed that. that. We'll, yeah. we'll put that in the Facebook chat later. Okay. If you want to um, hang around afterwards, 
um, and check back into the comments section. Uh, if you have comments on Facebook, please put them in the chat and Pamela will come back in and, and answer your questions, but we'll yeah. also put a, a cover of that in the chat section. Thank you. The, the, I won't have a paperback in my hand for about another week and a, and a hardback. We're doing hardbacks with this one as well. Um, reader requests. So you guys ask and uh, so it shall be done. <laughs> you know, you don't hear that very often. So uh, what, are, what are you working on now? Um, so I'm just finished up Snaggletooth. And because you mentioned prolific, kind of like a disease, right? It's like some kind of really nasty disease. Last year, I wrote five books. It was an accident. I said yes to too many projects. It nearly killed me. And so I made a vow when I finished Snaggletooth that I was going to take as long a break as I could before I started writing again. Well, I turned around and wrote a Patrick Flint short story two weeks later, but that was fun because it wasn't on the schedule. So this year, my goal is to only write two and I am purposely holding back. I'm starting to brainstorm the next one, which is Stag Party. I'm starting to work on my editorial calendar. I'm going back and re-recording audiobooks from early in my um, in my uh, other series, but I'm being really careful not to start the next one yet, because if I do, I know what happens. It's just like everything, everything, the world slips away and my hair is crazy and I don't brush my teeth and I'm in the same pair of pajamas for a week and my husband's rolling his eyes and I'm trying not to go there yet. Well, the good thing is you don't probably have a lot of neighbors peeking in your windows, so God. <laughs> nobody judges. We sure you don't. Know, so I, I asked you my what is usually my final question, but I'm fascinated. You run a publishing empire, <laughs> basically. Um, You're we, an independent publisher. Yes, we. Right? we um, I guess we were early adopters in the sense that when my husband and I sat down very early on, before I'd ever looked for an agent, and my husband said your friends that are traditionally published are miserable. They want more control than they have. You are a control freak. Let's try to do this together instead of you giving the reins to somebody else. And that scared me because I didn't want to be looked at as a loser, right? You know, someone who couldn't get their books published. But on the other hand, he was speaking the truth about the control. So we decided to do it and very quickly decided hey, this is kind of cool. This is kind of fun. We're having success. Let's bring some other authors in, but do it as a collaborative, as a kind of like a co-op in a sense that you're doing it independent together or you're doing non-traditional together and do everything different except the things that matter, which is picking good talent and then making sure that people provide their time, talent, and expertise in supporting each other. And it's been a lot of fun. We have some authors we're super proud of. Um, and, and that's the surprising piece of it to me is that I enjoy looking for other talent. I enjoy taking a raw manuscript and working with somebody on it uh, to try to make it the best that book that they can produce. And I, I never saw myself enjoying that. But I do. So we're, we're not going to look at you as just um, uh, a writer. We're looking at you as a creator, <laughs> uh, which, which is a great thing. And um, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. This went by way too quickly. Uh, hopefully you'll come back again. Love to. Okay. Well, be best of luck to you. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here with us. As I said, if you have questions and comments, please go into the Facebook comments. Pamela will um, jump in and check that hopefully as we go forward. Uh, and until next week, please stay safe and we will see you soon.